Um, good evening, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth uh, Connecting Communities Through Citizen Science um, session this month. And um, tonight I'm joining you from the land of the Gadigal people and I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, on which the um, University of Sydney was built. I recognise and pay my respect to the Gadigal people and there is no place in Australia, water, land or air, that has not been known, nurtured and loved by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I would love for you to extend our acknowledgement of country by sharing um, the traditional owners of the land that you're joining us from today. My name is Alice Motion. I am from the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney. Um, I'm also the host representative for the Australian Citizen Science Association. And so it's my a great privilege to be hosting uh, this conference series. And I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer who made this possible. Um, we have two wonderful people, uh, both named Claire, to hear from this evening um, in our session that's about local governments driving citizen, citizen science. Um, and I'd love for us to hear from both of them rather than for me to spend too much time speaking this evening. Um, our first uh, speaker is Claire Chaikin Bryan, who's the Smart Cities Lead at Lake Macquarie um, City Council. Um, where she's implementing numerous initiatives to support council operations and the community. Claire is a qualified town planner and civil and environmental engineer with a background in construction, planning and project, project controls, visual arts, graphics design, digital engineering and computer programming. And she's been working in the smart city space since 2016 and was the Australia New Zealand 2020 Smart Cities Emerging Leader. So um, I am sure that you're all very much looking forward to hear from Claire. I will stop sharing uh, just now and invite um, Claire to um, share her screen. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Just bring this up. Just confirming you guys can now see my screen. Yep, great. Thank you for that welcome, Alice. Um, yeah, I'm coming to you from Lake Macquarie City Council from the land of the Awabakal people. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, emerging. With over 60,000 years of innovation, they can surely inspire us today and inspire us into the future. Just a little bit of background around uh, Lake Macquarie City Council. We're just about two hours drive north of uh, the Sydney CBD. Uh, we have a nearby airport in Newcastle and we're over 750 square kilometres in size. And our name obviously comes from Lake Macquarie, which is the big lake in the middle of our local government area. We have over 200,000 residents, uh, a gross regional product of over 10 billion a year, and over 13,000 active businesses, which continue to grow um, and diversify in what they are doing in uh, the economy, given the changes that we are going through in the Hunter uh, as coal declines. So, I thought I'd kick off with uh, what is Smart Cities, given my role is the Smart Cities lead here at Lake Macquarie City Council. There are a number of definitions that are floating around about what a smart city is. Uh, we uh, use the definition from the Smart Cities Council, who are an international association um, who have chapters across the globe, um, that a smart city is one that uses technology and data to accelerate livability, workability and sustainability. And I'd like to point out that although smart cities is often uh, reflected in the tech space, it really at its core is around people and doing what we can to support people to be more innovative, to have a smarter cities, to ha live in better cities. Um, and sh people should not be forgotten when we're talking about uh, rolling out technology and data. Um, for us, our, our rollout of smart cities is rooted in achieving our community values, 
um, around the environment, diversifying our economy, lifestyle and well-being, mobility, accessibility, being a connected community, being creative, and also sharing in decision making. So the first initiative I wanted to talk to you about um, that we are involving our community in uh, is our Community Internet of Things network. So for those who don't know, the Internet of Things is essentially the connection of devices to the internet or devices to each other. Uh, the Internet of Things is a major space in smart cities. Uh, there are a number of different communications technologies, some of which you'd be familiar with, things like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, your 4G mobile network, but also other forms of um, connection are available. We use a network, our community IoT network up here is on LoRaWAN, also known as the Things Network. It's a publicly accessible free network that anyone in the community can use, whether you be from a business, a school student, or just irregular person uh, living uh, in the area. We've rolled out an extensive uh, network of gateways uh, that cover our local government area and beyond. Uh, one of uh, this bottom map is, uh, there's each of these gateways can um, provide signals, you know, 10, 20 kilometres, for example. And it's actually, LoRaWAN's a radio network. Um, that network, people can connect sensors. So say you want to measure the weather at your home or at your school. Uh, you can get by a sensor off the shelf um, and connect it to the network for free. And this is all provided by council. And we see the Internet Things as a really big, uh, important space for growing um, not only local uh, innovation and businesses, but also for learning about uh, data and what's going on in the world. I've got some examples here of some sensors that council uses. So these top two sensors are things that we use to measure the amount of amenities use uh, in our toilet blocks. So this helps us um, look at cleaning programs, whether we might need to add an additional toilet um, to a toilet block if we're renovating it. Um, and then we've also got down the side here, environmental sensing. Now these are very popular um, sorts of data that are really relatable to the community. And I'll get to in the next slide about how the community uses this data. Uh, we've got a temperature and humidity sensor. We have air quality sensors. Um, and we've had them uh, rolled out for a few years now. We also have a number of sensors on our beaches, one of which is a GPS tracking device that tracks our lifeguard rescue boards and our jet skis to understand the patterns that our lifeguards, uh, of movements of our lifeguards, how often are they going out, how much activity they're undertaking. And we're looking at that to show equivalency to our um, there, uh, sorry, to possibly rescues, the number of rescues or interventions that they are currently undertaking and what are the associated weather wave conditions that are happening at the same time. Now, you know, you don't just have to buy off the self, self sensors like we use at Council. We also have, um, and I've got a picture from one of our workshops in the top right, uh, you can build your own sensors. And we recently ran a number of workshops that were free for the community to come along and learn about how do I connect a sensor to the network, but also get a little bit of hands-on experience around, okay, what does a self-built sensor look like and what are the different components that are there? Um, and we see this as a way for people to create new ways of doing things at a really um, accessible um, level and a low barrier in to entry. So the next, so 
data from our sensors um, right now for our environmental sensors, so temperature, humidity, air quality sensors, we currently feed into our open data portal. Our open data portal is at data.lakemat.com.au um, and it's a portal where um, people can interact, not only get the data and download it, but interact with it. They can create maps, they can uh, create graphs and this is a really accessible tool for skill students to use. Now at the same time we started rolling out um, environmental sensors we created a program called Adopt a Sensor where people um, have adopted essentially a temperature and humidity sensor and placed it in their backyard. Um, schools have also adopted a few sensors we have a few schools who have temperature and humidity sensors and a few that have air quality sensors and the way they access that data from that sensor that they've adopted is through this open data portal and they get that continued support from council around getting access to the data in a really um, easy to access way that doesn't require them to have additional tools or expertise Moving on, um, another initiative that we have run this year that really connects into encouraging our young people in particular to innovate uh, is we ran a high school protothon event. So a protothon is similar to a hackathon, but you actually have to make something, you create a prototype. Um, we, for this protothon, had uh, 12 students from across our local government area participating. Fingers crossed that our next one we will get more. And they uh, worked through a whole day where they were given a number of community challenges that we're currently facing. They then had to go away and brainstorm a solution to those challenges, a particular one of the challenges that interested them. Uh, and then they had to go forward and create their prototype. Not only did they use cardboard and paper and pens and uh, all sorts of arts and crafts tools, they also needed to um, utilise a computer board, do some computer programming, and they had access to sensors, lights, um, and various different electronics components to create an electrical element as well as a cardboard prototyping element. They'd experience presenting their ideas and pitching their ideas uh, to the room, both in the middle of the day when they finished ideation as well as the end of the day. And the feedback we got from both the students and the teachers who were observing was that a really positive one. They really wanted to come back next time. This was the first time one we, we've run um, and people were a little unsure about what it was going to involve, but uh, they went home to, and tell it, to tell their friends and their families about how much fun that they had and that they would love to do it again. And these sorts of activities we see as a way of um, activating about not only finding new ways of addressing local community challenges but with also getting the community directly involved but also inspiring young people to get into STEAM careers and um, to take on the challenge of doing something they haven't done before. A number of the students that participated in this protothon had had no computer coding no real computer coding experience and were a little unsure but by the end of the day they you know felt a little bit more confident and felt they could take this somewhere again. Um, so it was a really exciting event where we got them very um, involved and they got very hands-on um, and I do have the prototypes here at council and we are working on a way to display them uh, to the community. And coming off the back of the protophon and prototyping space, uh, we have a brand new initiative that I'm currently in the process of setting up, and this is the Lake Mac Fab Lab. So the Fab Lab will be a place for people to come and play and create, to be mentored, to invent new things, essentially a place for learning and innovation. It's all around, um, you know, encouraging um, those STEAM skills, entrepreneurship, um, you know, learning around addressing community challenges and solving local and global challenges. 
And one of the key things um, with the Fab Lab is it's open to all. Um, it'll have industrial grade fabrication electronics tools available for Fab Lab users to use and it'll be activated by a program of ongoing workshops and events. This includes, you know, specific events for schools. We know um, getting access to equipment like 3D printers, industrial level laser cutters and engravers, um, CNC mills and the like. Um, you know, for most public schools, they struggle to get access to these sorts of this sort of equipment. So the idea behind this space is to provide an affordable um, place where anyone can come and get some experience, where we can get idea exchange between uh, different generations, but, um, and where we can look to create um, the new ideas of tomorrow and support the innovators of today and tomorrow. And that's all from me. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you for sharing that lovely presentation. Um, we're going to hold questions um, to, till the end of Claire, Dr. Claire Murray's talk. Um, so please do store them up. Um, but let's thank Claire for her for her um, presentation um, in the Zoom on a tradition of uh, emojis or silent clapping. Um, we I also would just like to remind everybody, especially for those people who haven't come to one of these sessions before, it's fantastic to see you. And um, that what we do is we record from five until six. We will record some of the discussion. If you feel comfortable coming on to camera or unmuting. We'd love to hear you ask the question with your own wonderful voice. If you would prefer for me to ask that question to Claire and Claire, and um, if you put it in the chat, I will do so. And then at six o'clock, we stop recording so that folks who might prefer not to be on uh, a recording that's posted on the internet um, can, can ask uh, our speakers some questions. So just to remind you of that format. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Dr. Claire Murray to share her slides. Um, it's lovely to, to welcome another chemist, a fellow chemist, um, to speak this evening. Um, Claire has also um, is joining us from Europe, so thanks for joining us in your morning, Claire. Um, she's a chemist at the European Citizen Science Association, and she's really interested in informal learning, science communication, and equity and justice in STEM. She's working on SEEDS, which is a EU, EU Horizon 2020 funded citizen science project for teenagers in Spain, the UK, Netherlands and Greece. And this project has partners in academia, research and local government. Uh, the aim is to provide effectiveness of health promotion interventions to this population, whereby teenagers lead the process to transform their habits, contributing to sustainable behavioral change. The interventions that are created through um, the interventions are created, sorry, through events called makeathons, which will empower them to create change for themselves and their peers. And Claire Murray uh, will do a much better job of explaining that. So I'd like to hand over to Claire. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Claire Murray to the session. Hello, Australia. Berlin calling. Um, I am very pleased to be here. I hope. My Wi-Fi is stable. Uh, if people can give a thumbs up, if you, it is holding. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so uh, my name is also Claire, which I think is an excellent name. Very pleased to be on the call with another Claire. And I work at the European Citizen Science Association. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and my email and my Twitter account are here. And um, just to note um, throughout my talk, I personally have I'm trying to be more inclusive in my talks and one of the things I'm uh, trying to do now is to be more inclusive for those who are visually impaired. So you will see that there might be a couple of things that I do that maybe uh, you might want to consider in your own talk. So uh, first of all, I will just give a quick description of myself. So I am a, a Caucasian woman. Uh, I have brown hair that's probably just down to my chest and I have brown eyes. I'm wearing some big headphones and a black t-shirt so I look quite dark against the white background and I also have some fabulous birdies by the artist Egg Picnic who are in Australia and who are amazing in my background and um, on my slide there are uh, most of the uh, images are um, illustrative or 
um, logos, so they're not important in the context of the information. But the one big logo that is on the slide is the seeds logo, which is a really nice little logo. It's a plant growing from a seed and overlaps onto an atomic, uh, a bad representation of an atom, I would say, as a chemist. But perhaps that's just me. So I'm now going to talk about seeds itself. So to start with, I'm going to work my way through the seeds project and then get into the role of local government in seeds because there's quite a big uh, role there. I think one of the things you might also notice is actually there's quite a big overlap between makeathons and protothons. So that would be a really nice conversation that I'm looking forward to having with Claire later. Um, but first of all, what is SEEDS? Well, it's a citizen science project running in four countries in Europe, Spain, the Netherlands, UK and Greece. We aim to improve healthy lifestyles amongst teenagers by empowering them and to increase STEM literacy. There are six partners and we have a really broad range of expertise, which is really exciting for this project. We are covering citizen science, uh, healthy lifestyles, lots of experts in public health and um, exercise evaluation and also local government. We are running for two years and we have Horizon 2020 funding. The kind of the core elements of SEEDS can be boiled down to this graphic here, which is three circles. The first circle uh, is called focus groups and has two subsections called question and discuss. The idea here is this is the stage that will be running in July and August this year, where teenagers in these four countries will discuss specifically uh, elements around uh, sedentary behaviour and also exercise, because those are two of the areas that we are focusing on with this project. And they will basically talk about how they feel about this, how they feel their surroundings influence them, how they feel opportunities influence them. And we will use these focus groups to then uh, help us direct the makeathons, which is the second circle in the center, which has three subsections saying create, test and explore. I'm going to discuss makeathons in a lot more detail because they're one of the biggest parts of the projects. But the idea is just that we will take some of the questions that the teenagers have in the focus groups and bring them through into the makeathons. In the makeathons, the teenagers will create innovation uh, interventions rather that will be implemented in schools around Europe for six months. So these um, interventions, which are the third circle on this on the slide, have um, they will be doing things like they'll be analyzing, solving problems, practicing, and eventually, hopefully, making change in their lives. And that's one of the key things that we need to think about. If they're going to actually make change in their lives, how can we empower them? How, how can they feel like their voice matters? And it, it, that's constantly a question underpinning us and our work. So one of the things that I really wanted to highlight, and I think I feel like Claire's done a brilliant job already of talking about this. You know, teenagers, they need to shape the project at every stage so they feel connected to the project, so that they feel like their voice matters, so that actually we have a chance at being successful with this project. And so, in, for example, the concept of the ideas in the makeathons being made into interventions, the teenagers will actually be involved in saying, okay, actually, these interventions are these intervention ideas that were made in the makeathons are not so strong, we would prefer to deploy these ideas. And so at each point, we will be checking in with teenagers and working with them to shape the concept of the whole project of seeds. So make a who, make a how, make a what. Um, this is just a quick overview of makeathons. I do, I think it's worthwhile talking about this because it can seem like a really vague concept sometimes. And like I said, there's an awful lot of overlap with um, prototons, which is really exciting. Um, the rough definition is that makers plus marathon, makeathon. So it's creative, collaborative uh, challenges in a very short amount of time that brings together people from different backgrounds to reflect on and tackle a single cause together. Each team is free to create whatever it wants from a preset theme or subject, which is revealed to them at the last moment, so they have free reign to improvise. Uh, all disciplines can take part and everyone can interpret the theme in their own way. Makeathons also generally have responsible and ethical aspect. People come together to create a piece of work that's environmentally friendly, uh, unique and innovative. Um, and this de these definitions have been adapted from Going to Distance with Makeathons, which is a really nice overview article. Why are we using makeathons? Which I think is one of the big questions here. Well, teenagers are the experts. They have so much experience, so much knowledge. 
they are living their lives every day. They see the issues that are, you know, going on in the world around them. They are therefore the best people to try and solve their pro this problem. And when I say this problem, in our context, it's healthy lifestyles, like I said, looking at sedentary behavior and also exercise. But the make -a concept could be applied to anything. So it's something that's quite big and quite broad and really an exciting space to explore. The second reason is that we should really think about how change happens. You know, are teenagers more likely to change their behavior if some of, you know, a teacher, a parent, an expert lectures at them? And I think that's something that we, we often overlook when we think about change. We should really be trying to work with them and to listen to their voices when we are creating this change, because that's more likely to create sustainable change, which I think is a really key thing more people need to consider. Megathons are one way to do this because the teenagers will be in charge of the change. They will be the ones who work together with the classmates to identify what the problem is. Because, you know, if you think about sedentary behavior, that's quite a big space. You know, are you, are you thinking about sedentary behavior during the day at home? You know, if so, is there something around TV? Is there something around phones? It's, there's lots of different angles here. So the teenagers are the ones who will say, well, actually, the thing I'm concerned about is this. And that is therefore something that's quite important in this conversation because they will then be the best people to help us and them create an intervention for change. I hope you get the idea already that actually this whole approach means we don't really know what's going to happen, which can be quite terrifying at times, but it's also kind of amazing because there's an awful lot of work ongoing to make sure, you know, the teenagers are the ones who will shape every step. So, uh, you know, as people who are coming from research backgrounds or, or from local governments, that can be quite frightening, you know, and you need to learn to be able to let go and actually say, okay, we don't have influence over this. And that is correct. That is the case. Because if I tell a teenager, for example, you should do this every time you play with your mobile phone, that's never going to work. That's, that's just a waste of time. So this is something that is really uh, exciting, actually, about this project. And our role in the project, our job is to give teenagers the right tools and the right information, if they request it, to empower them to create and innovate. And um, in thinking about how to run a makeathon, so for us, we're at a very early stage in the project. We're just six months in. Like I said, the focus groups haven't even started yet. Um, the makeathons should run September, October time is the current plan. Obviously, COVID has created some complications, but we're, we're working on it. Um, so this is a, a graphic or a, a sort of short description of the different um, the, the different makeathon stages. Um, our makeathon we've had to respond to COVID and make sure that it works flexibly so that if, for example, we have to do it online, we are able to deliver that. And I think all of us would agree that actually a situation where you're stuck online for the entire day would be horrendous. Whereas a make it on, you know, in person uh, would easily run for a whole day. That would be quite nice. So in the design principle for this, we've had to say, okay, for the worst case scenario where we're online only, we think, you know, two two and a half hours of content is kind of the the max with built-in breaks obviously on top of this is the max that we could run for to make sure we actually achieve something sensible so in doing that thinking about the stages um on the far left we have the pre-event which is before the event that's just the work for the seeds team to actually work through we then have 15 minutes for empathizing five minutes for defining the problem 10 to 20 minutes for ideating ideating i'm never quite sure how to say that um up to one hour for prototyping and testing. And then at the very end, 15 minutes for pitch, which is leaving time open for discussions. And this is adapted from Makeathon, a blueprint for SDG innovation, which is a really nice paper. What are these stages and why do we need them? Well, with, like I said, with the pre-event, we need to do the work beforehand to make sure we're ready. But the empathized stage is actually to help them understand the problems we want them to address and to help them solve. And we're going to share a little of the science, but not too much because we don't want to, for example, we don't want partners to force the students down a particular line of thinking. So it's quite careful to consider how we talk about and how we shape um, our ideas or, or the questions rather. And then we will need to share the questions that we want them to answer um, with their expertise. They'll then talk about the question with their team. So to work out what they actually understand by the question and what different ideas they might have. And then they will start to prototype and test. 
And this is like the most critical stage. It involves taking the ideas from the ED8 stage and creating a draft of the intervention and then testing it out in groups. This is really, really critical because if they don't work out which interventions are the optimal ones, then you know the, the whole seed project is never going to work. At the very end, we'll then share the ideas with the groups and work out which ones are the best. And the best interventions will be put forward and put into action um, for schools in six months in their country. For us, other things that we really need to make sure that we address is that prototypes matter. So we want to get the students making prototypes as quickly as possible um, to make better models in the next round of design. Knowing what works is just as important as what doesn't work. Um, but also for us to just really you know, focus on the fact that the teenagers' voices matter. They have skills and expertise we need. And also that interests matter. So the intervention is going to run for six months. That's a long time. If it's going to be effective, we need to make sure it's easy for them to do, it's easy for them to deploy. There's not a massive energy barrier attached to doing the intervention. So the thing that I think people are going to be really interested in, or you know, one of the main uh, links for this talk is why is the local government interested? So if you look, um, if you're able to see down the bottom with all the logos, one of the key logos uh, for this talk is the city of Rotterdam. So the city of Rotterdam actually came on board. They're already quite well connected to Erasmus MC, which is one of the, the newest universities in, um, in the Netherlands. I think it's about 50 years old. Um, but they're actually really, really excited and interested in this project for many reasons. Um, one of them is that the city of Rotterdam actually has many health issues. And on average, they're higher than the rest of the country in the Netherlands. Life expectancy is lower in Rotterdam as compared to the Netherlands, and childhood obesity is larger in Rotterdam as compared to the Netherlands. So only 18% of 13 to 16 year olds meet the physical activity standard, for example. The interventions they've tried don't seem to work very well as they haven't really been able to close the gap sufficiently over the past few years. So this means that actually Rotterdam are really, really excited about using citizen science approach to talk with teenagers about solutions because they want real and meaningful change. They're also focused on legacy. And for me, this was really exciting and really interesting because they're focusing now at the very start of the project on legacy. They're already saying, how can we make sure that this actually stays in, you know, that these legacies or these interventions stay in the community and that actually we're able to empower even more teenagers to participate in make -a-thons. So this is a really interesting time because it gives us more opportunity to create long lasting change. And I think it's almost, it's an interesting thing to reflect on because it runs counter to sort of the two year grant, you know, push where you basically have two years to deliver a project. And Rotterdam is saying, well, what about beyond the two years? How can we, we do that? So that's a really big, an opportunity and a challenge. There's also lots of interest from other local governments. And one of the things that I, I should say is that actually with the Megathons, they, the teenagers will be working with some stakeholders and some of those stakeholders will be from local government because they're going to help the teenagers develop different interventions. So this is a really exciting opportunity because we have the opportunity to make long lasting change. But it does mean we need to think very carefully about where, you know, what we leave behind in the project. So as you know, project organizers, we need to make sure we have good guidelines, we have good contacts, we have good structure, because we need to make it easy, not just for Rotterdam, but also for other local governments to deploy our activities. So this is a really big consideration. Um, I'm going to just end my talk here, but if you want any more information, our website is still, I mean, it's still under development, so there's nothing to see there right now, but hopefully soon there will be. It's uh, www.seedsmakeathons.com. We are also on Twitter at smakeathons. And if you would like to contact me personally, very happy to talk to anyone. We're also very happy to take questions. Um, my email is claire.murray at mfn.berlin. And my Twitter handle is at Dr. Claire Murray. So I will pass back to Alice and like I said I'm very happy to answer questions and also very thankful for Alice for the invitation to speak today. Um, thank you so much Claire that was wonderful um, let's give uh, both of our speakers um, a Twitter um, thanks so um, thank you very much for, for, for speaking this evening um, we have um, some questions in the chat um, I think um, our first questioner has um, had to, has popped out or the connection has, has failed. So I might ask that question on their behalf. Um, but if anybody would like to unmute or to put their video on and ask um, either or both of the Claire's a question, 
um, I'm sure they'd be very happy to receive one from you. So please just indicate if you have anything to ask. Um, otherwise, I might take it away because I have lots of questions. Um, so I think I might just start, I might start from the, the, the local government angle because um, it's great to hear from somebody who's working in local government and somebody who's working with local government. And I was wondering, maybe from both of your perspectives, how do you think, as somebody who works in local government, Claire Chike and Brian, um, that people who you're working with in universities or in communities, people who are leading projects, could work, um, could you know, could could you? How could I'm not saying how could they be better, but how could um, you find? You know, what would help you to work with them in a in a more meaningful way? And Claire, perhaps you could reflect on how. What could local government do to help you um, to work with them in a more meaningful way? Because I think we all um, are very passionate about the outcomes, but sometimes when we come from different spaces, we don't quite speak the same language um, as, as our other partners. So um, I hope that's an okay question to start. And I might start with Claire CB. Yeah, um, it was great to hear uh, Claire talk about the interventions and thinking about what happens afterwards. I think that's uh, one of the, some of those, sometimes a barrier for some local governments. They do go, oh, we're, we're part, it's great to be part of this, but what happens when you go away? Everyone else goes away and now it's on us to keep delivering. Um, and when we are getting, you know, our resources are getting tighter and our budgets are getting tighter and how do we, um, you know, move forward with that? And it's an interesting sort of challenge we talk about here and how the role of the broader community of volunteers in um, keeping initiatives going that, not just relying on local government for things. We've recently um, given out a grant for a trial of uh, collecting fishing line in bins um, at local fishing spots. And we don't have the resources to go collect that fishing line to then take it to the place where it's going to be recycled into street furniture. But the company who uh, has put the initiative forward is organising a local group of volunteers through all the fishing clubs who will do all the collections and that's how you know for us is like we're like okay well that's fine we'll support that and we'll let you roll that out and um you know we from a staffing perspective can handle that then we're like okay we're all good and you're going to take care of that um because I think sometimes there's missed opportunities there when there's that fear of oh what are we going to do about that thing when <laughs> when everyone else goes away um so having a plan for that is is really good I'm, I'm glad to hear that um is concepts there I think um in terms of partners um we've done a lot of partnering with universities and different organizations like pri um, private companies um through a number of our projects in the smart cities space um and we've found that yeah they they are on a bit of a journey in understanding how local government works and I think that listening part's really important um but we're on a journey too and understanding how do we work more flexibly um and change our ways of doing things um, I'm probably what they call not your typical council worker <laughs> um, so I'm very open to different things and um, part of my role is to help facilitate you know that connection and change um, but if you don't have that advocate internally in that local government then you're probably going to struggle I suppose. <laughs> Thanks Claire Chag and Brian maybe Claire Murray would you would you be able to to come in on? That yeah question? certainly I think it's it's been a very different experience for me. Like I, an awful lot of my previous work involved working very closely like with academics. I've never really gotten to, to work with local government. So this opportunity has really changed how I, how I think about what I'm doing. Because it's, like I said, you know, legacy is important. And I, I come back to that a lot, but that's just because it's something that's, you know, it's kind of already a question before, you know, we haven't done any focus groups. We haven't even made an intervention. You know, we haven't even done the make thons But they're like... So how are we going to deploy this in the future? Who's going to be in charge? How are we going to do this? You know, where's the guidelines? And, and you're kind of going, actually, that's a really important thing if, you know, if we want sustainable change. And that's it's kind of one of the things that we already say is, you know, we want sustainable change in the group of teenagers. But 
in the academic sense, we're kind of thinking of the teenagers that we're running the interventions with this year, and we're not really seeing past that point. So I, I've been very grateful for that opportunity to start like shaping it, shaping a bit more critically my own ideas around you know how I talk about things and how I should be delivering and developing projects. But I think also from, uh, I think our experience is perhaps a little bit different because because the uh, city of Rotterdam is so closely linked to government that um, sorry, Erasmus MC rather because Erasmus MC is so closely linked to the city of Rotterdam. They, and they have like co-placements. This means that actually they, they're they kind of aware of the, that they may be more flexible than other local governments can be, you know, because they've already had those kind of initial difficult exchanges going, actually, we can't change something, you know, in two weeks. That's not a possibility of local government. Um, so all of that has kind of already been ironed out. So in, in some senses, I think our experiences are a bit different because they're already, they've got so many projects together, they're working seamlessly, you know, and, and have developed that rapport. But for people who are going into this for the first time, I think that's something you really need to, to consider and, and to be, you know, to maybe, like I said, give people time, listen when people talk about their priorities and try to make sure that your, you know, your answers and your projects clearly maps out how it connects to those priorities, because that's something that can take a long time for people to understand. Um, and I think it's really, but it makes everyone's lives so much easier. If you kind of say, yes, so we're going to help you deliver this target that you really need to hit. That's a very clear, they're going, oh, of course we want to collaborate because that's really useful. Whereas if you go this really long winded route around, it's a lot harder to kind of get that synergy going quickly, which then complicates the relationship. So. Thanks, Claire. I think that's really interesting perspectives because I think um, I think the one of the great things about collaboration when it goes well, especially with different spaces, is that you learn that sometimes the way that you've been doing things um, logistically or, you know, sort of structuring a project um, actually isn't the best way to do it or that you can learn from some people who've got this kind of more strategic oversight. I think that's something I personally really enjoy. Um, I've got a couple of chat questions in the chat. I'm waiting for them to build up a little bit more too and seeing if anyone would like to ask you a question. Claire, Chike and Brian, I would like to come in with one more for you if that's okay. Um, and that is, um, if, I, if I'm a citizen or if I'm a citizen science project um, within the community and I would like to work with local government to set up my own project or for local government to support it, is there a place for me to go or is there something you would advise me to do um, if I wanted a partner with, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll speak to Lake Macquarie, but, you know, more broadly speaking too, would you have any advice for somebody in that position? Yeah, I think that's always the challenge interacting with local government is finding the right person that you should be talking to. It can be a bit of a minefield, um, you know, you're on the outside trying to look in, trying to find people. Um, slowly people are finding about finding out about me and discovering me and trying to, um, you know, we now have an email address, which is just a um, smart city at latemap.com nsw.gov.au that's on our website now so people can when they're looking at stuff get in contact with me particularly now that we're trying to um, encourage people onto the internet of things network um yeah it's a china like for lake macquarie i'm probably the best placed person and then i would connect depending on what that person was interested in doing i'd then connect them with the relevant team as well within council um yeah, it's a challenge. How do you approach it for you? You'd have no idea who they are. You can always do the cold call straight, just call up council, um, talk to customer service and go, look, I'm trying to do this. Who's your person that's looking after, you know, innovation or, um, you know, have a bit of a Google search on that, your particular council and find out, are they doing smart cities? Are they doing a particular thing in innovation? There might be something there that they've done some engagement on in a person's name or at least you know 
that they are doing something. So you can then ask customers, oh, can you put me through to the person who looks after X, Y, Z? You might get the bit of a ring around and you end up with one person and then they go, oh, no, 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 I'm not the right person. You've got to go to this person. The other way is if you got a specific thing. So, for example, um, most councils have like a sustainability officer or someone in a similar role. So if you're looking or, you know, sustainability, edu sustainability education or waste education or something, you know, if you've got that, particular focus area you could probably ask for that person um, you could do some stalking on LinkedIn as well <laughs> find out who they are uh, who works at that council um, but yeah I, I admit it is a very it is a challenge but once you find your right person you, you're in and you're good and you know that person I'm hoping through projects like um, the Fab Lab which will open us up to a lot uh, more people and ideas and be a very accessible space that through that people will feel um, more comfortable approaching us around ideas, particularly from, you know, um, that grassroots level, you know, the people who, um, you know, they're just in their community and they want to do something. That's fabulous. And um, Claire, I might ask you offline if you can help me to sort of write up a, a you know, a top tip sheet for AXA members. Um, <laughs> sure. Approaching, approaching local government, because um, there were a lot of very interesting things um, that you mentioned there that I think would be very helpful. Um, Claire, did you want to respond to that or um, you're no, yeah, all good? Makes perfect sense. I, I think Michelle has um, come, um, um, come on camera and has a question to ask. I've seen from the chat, Michelle, could I welcome you to ask your question? Sure. I just want to know, ladies, for both of you, this is one for both of you, what are the timelines for your project? How long have you taken to set it all up? How long did you allocate for, you know, those talks to those, those key stakeholders and those talks to other local government officers, et cetera? It's just how long did it take? I'll, I'll, I'll go first, I guess. Uh, depends on the project. Our, uh, the whole community IoT network has been a growing work in progress over, oh gosh, I think three, almost four years that we've started down that journey. Um, and it's really come to fruition over the last 12 months where we had only a couple gateways. And then over the last 12 months, we've expanded to almost 20 gateways around our local government area. Um, and now we're in the phase of the next 12 to 18 months is encouraging more people and educating people on that network and how they can use it. Um, both for me, for the general community and the public, but also for me internally in council, given we use it for our operations as well. Uh, Fab Lab, uh, which is our newest initiative, uh, we're looking at uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, launching uh, in August during Science Week, um, if all goes to plan. Uh, if not, it would be September um, and we'll be, yeah, going pretty hard at that for the first year and trying to get people into the space and encouraging people to become members of the club for that space. Um, just trying to think what else. Uh, the adopt a sensor program has been running for two years. Uh, we are now reviewing, uh, do we run another tranche of where we give more sensors out or, um, you know, looking at the success of that. Uh, the open data portal we've been working on the last 12 months. Um, we're now happy with the tool that we've got. And then over the next 12 months, our focus is adding more data on there so that people can actually uh, get more value. So right now we just have our environmental data on there, but we want to add more data um, and make it, um, yeah, more interesting and more attractive for people to get on there and, um, you know, do a bit of data literacy and learn a bit more about their city. Um, and have a bit of a play. I think for us, um, like I said, it's it's a bit of a different situation because the city of Rotterdam already had a good relationship with Erasmus MC. So in terms of like establishing the relationship, I, I, that's gone on for over years. But the the grant was written last year and submitted last year, and we got money um, and got the go in January twenty twenty one. So it's basically, you know, we're delivering this in two years um, the key conversations with local government stakeholders um, will, other local government stakeholders will probably start in sort of 
maybe end of July, August time for engagement in the makeathons in um, in September, October time. But then there will also be engagement beyond that because obviously, the, like the makeathons are just one off events. But actually, what we're also interested in is engaging local governments in the results. And so there will then have to be, you know, there will be then conversations. And, and what we would like and we hope is that we can have the teenagers, you know, together with the local government stakeholders having those conversations and not just be us standing there representing the teenagers, because that goes against everything that we have tried to work towards so far. Um, but obviously we're doing all of this against a background of COVID and everything else. So things are tricky to manage, um, uh, but we're trying. So, yeah, it's. The project itself is going to be one in two years, but the local government stakeholder interactions are, are, you know, hopefully going to be happening, like I said, over the next year or so. Thank you, Beth. Um, I jump in with another question, um, just that links to that, and then I'll come to the one in the chat. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, in terms of working with local government, um, particularly, um, often projects that are funded or supported tie in with um, the strategy of a local government or what's permitted to be funded. Um, and I was wondering, you know, to what extent you think that projects like these with citizen scientists um, and engaging community members could then inform the next stage of the strategy or policy. So how does this tie back into local or even national um, uh, policy? Um, is there, would you mind uh, um, sharing your perspective on that? Yeah, well, for um, so local governments, major, um, there, there, there are a number of different names in Australia that we call them community strategic plans, um, council plans, community plans. All, no matter what it is, it's all basically the same documents. The values, the goals, where are we heading as a local government? They get done uh, every four years in New South Wales, every time we have a new council election. So we go through an election, new council, and then we go through a process of um, community engagement to create the next plan. Um, so that's kind of the cycle of the major plan that then feeds into all of the other plans. Uh, eventually over time, things aren't exactly perfectly in sync. Things that, you know, we make 10 year plans and one year plans or things that um, don't even have a time limit. And some things get updated more regularly than others. Um, but in terms of, yeah, getting input into that, the best time is to do something that's probably in that year before that plan is being um, reviewed and renewed or changed. Um, so right now we are actually in an election uh, year. We got delayed by a year um, from COVID. So we've actually got a, uh, we're on the fifth year of a four year plan at the moment. Um, so that's probably the ideal time if we're talking in the Australian context, um, have something run in the beginning of that year before the elections and all of that happens and then um, going into something that will form part of that community engagement that can be referred to or even maybe during something, if it's something fast like uh, a make -thon or something that's... Um, over a shorter period of time could be uh, incorporated into that um, engagement period of time uh, where uh, you could do something and then um, be able to have it form part of a direct conversation with the community you're having at that point in time. Thank you. Um, I've got lots of direct questions coming to me as direct messages. If anyone who's put their question in the chat would like to ask their question, please come on camera or on mute. I'll give you a second to do so before I share those questions. Um, there's definitely one from Ziggy, um, which I will ask unless Ziggy wants to, to come on. Um, so Ziggy would like to ask how widespread is the approach across, I'm um, sorry, how widespread is the approach your local government has taken across New South Wales and Australia more widely? Ooh, de depends what approach. Um, if we're talking, uh, so for example, LoRaWAN, the uh, Community Internet of Things Network style, public free Internet of Things Network, I 
think there's now, well, 40 or 50 now across Australia. In terms of smart cities, it'd probably be around the same number. It kind of fluctuates and sometimes it's a bit hidden around uh, who, who's who in the zoo in that space. Um, we aren't the first ones that, so a fab lab, for example, is very similar to a maker space. So we want, we're definitely not the first in Australia to do that. There aren't any, uh, we are signing up to the uh, International Fab Foundation, um, of which there are no local governments in Australia currently involved in a fab lab uh, like that, but there are plenty of maker spaces. Um, yeah, I suppose, Look, yes, we are probably a little bit out there and a little bit different. Um, we are seen as one of the leaders and influencers in a few different spaces and, and in that sort of pack of trying to change how local government approaches things. So I do get calls from other local governments around Australia wanting advice on everything from internet things to I'm sure we're going to get lots of calls about this fab lab once we launch. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Ziggy. Sorry if I jumped in and asked that. No, no, no. It's, it's all right. No um, I, Claire, um, I might go to the next question if that's all right. Um, um, Alex, I think, had a question that they wanted to ask. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering about the role of local business and the relationship between the local councils implementing uh, smart cities and so forth and citizen science projects. Um, what is the role of uh, local business in those, uh, in those initiatives? For me? You probably oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we are trying to encourage our local businesses. Actually, one of our, our the recent prothon we we ran and also um, uh, also slated for our fab lab. We have a local sort of maker education business who also resell um, tools for makers as a retail business. Um, we're very and they also manufacture their own. Um, boards and sensors and things like that it's an amazing business local business to have um mm, so mm. uh yeah we're trying to they, they're going to be involved but we are constantly trying to find those people and local business and get them out of the woodworks to be involved in things um it was interesting running the community um internet things uh workshops and we had a few people from business there who we're kind of curious about what this space of Internet of Things was and how they might be able to use it in their own business. Um, so, but didn't necessarily, they, they were a bit scared because they had to do a little bit of computer programming again, but I told them, you know, give it a go. Uh, but you definitely hire someone to do this for you so you don't have to worry. Um, so getting them, uh, yeah, there's that sort of uh, aspect of getting them involved. And we're always asking you know what can we do to as a council where we're asking you know what can we do to support you um, and we for example try to procure things locally um, we actually recently adopted a circular economy policy uh, which mm. is really having that starting to have an influence on you know trying to procure within our region um, and thinking about where things come from and you know what happens to them afterwards and uh, you know what's the role of our local businesses in that um, so yeah because there's a lot of so startups who are trying to do sorry a lot of startups trying to do um, I don't know recycling for example mm. Or, or using local products as an as an alternative to, you know, things with uh, high fly miles attached. Um, yeah, so I, I can imagine there's an engagement strategy there. Mm -hmm. yes, there definitely is as well, because you have a situation where, you know, who are, in the case of, say, snacking, for example, who are the people who are influencing that? Well, they're going to be, for example, the canteen workers or the people who are deciding what food is stocked in the canteen. And so there is definite policy that we want to, you know, we canteen um, whole, uh, managers are going to definitely be one of the crowd of people that will be engaged. Um, mm. And then I think there's also one of the other stakeholders that could be really interesting is local supermarkets. 
because, you know, if the students leave the schools and they go out and they get snacks, where are they getting the snacks from? It's local supermarkets. And it's thinking about, you know, what's attractive for the students is, is going to be, you know, they're the key influencers there in that case. So there's definitely mm-hmm. a role for local businesses in projects like this. And I think it's just, you need to work out how do you give them, like, what are their incentives? What are their policies? Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually where having local government and local businesses is really powerful because sometimes, you know, for example, as an academic, you approach a local business and you say, oh, you should do this. That is maybe less of an incentive than if the local government says you should do this. It's, it's a bit more, they have a bit more power in some contexts. That's true. And of course, there's the jobs involved as well. You've got local jobs for people graduating who've got these skills. So, uh, yeah, you can see there could be a thriving uh, sort of local economy built around these ideas. Yeah, the teenagers Alan. who do these beautiful innovations, uh, 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 sorry, interventions, uh, could carry that on to, to build business around that potentially. You know? yeah, absolutely. Mm. Thanks, yeah. Ellie. Yeah, that's definitely Thanks. the similar thing for us with the Fab Lab and seeing them like create and then, you know, hopefully mm. gra- essentially graduate from the Fab Lab and go on yeah. and create their own businesses. I will quickly address um, Stephen, who's not online anymore. I see his question in the chat about, you know, we are talking a lot about, you know, young kids and students and that, um, but what about older members? And uh, yes, we've had some interested interest from older members in our community who, you know, the hobbyists and the makers and, you know, they just want to get in there and create stuff. Um, so we see in particular Fab Lab as the opportunity, you know, for them to come in and be part of that space and possibly volunteer to help run the space um, and, you know, interact with those younger people. So we get this cross-generational exchange and, um, yeah, have a bit of fun. Thank you, Claire. Um, Claire, if you wanted to respond to... Stephen's question about um, uh, older members of the community too, that would be fab. And I'm also going to sneak in one question before we start recording as well. So I'll I'll give you that one to respond to if you'd like to. Um, Tracy has asked, um, what's being made in the makeathons? Could you provide some example or or the protothons? Um, Would you be able to share with us um, some examples? So um, I'll hand to Claire Murray. Um, for those questions first and then come back to Claire and then we'll stop the recording and continue the conversation if people would like to. Yeah, cool. Well, I think, so our project is very specifically focusing at uh, teenagers and, and that's because of the, the research interests of, of the kind of the, the researchers involved aligned very much with teenager groups. However, there's lots of work going on uh, researching interventions, even at local government level. So in the case of Rotterdam, for example, there's a massive uh, Rotterdam study. The most recent paper, the big paper was in 2018, I think. It's like over a 20 year period, they're looking at health and how that changes over time. Um, But in terms of citizen science connections and health, I, I think at the moment, we're not investigating that, but that doesn't mean we might not in the future. Um, but I think also then, uh, so for Tracy's question, what have been made in the makeathons? We don't know. <laughs> because it's, the, well, we don't know, but it's an intervention. So as an idea, but again, you know, I have to be very careful with how many times I talk about these ideas because I don't want to indirectly influence the teenagers. The teenagers could decide that for every... 10 minutes they play with their phone, they have to stand up and run on the spot for two minutes, right? As, as an example of an intervention. And then the idea is that in the make they'll say, okay, well, actually that's an idea, but how reasonable is this? How practical is this? Can everyone do this? And they will test it out in situ during the prototype and test phase. So for us, you know, when we talk as an intervention, it's possible there may not be like physical prototypes. There's more prototyping of ideas and of uh, things that will influence behavioral change. So that, that's what the teenagers are designing as an intervention is something that will influence their behavior and help them live a healthier lifestyle. Um, so that, that would be maybe some version of an answer. But like I said, the kind of exciting thing is that we don't know yet what the interventions will be and we don't know what they'll make in the makeathons. But yeah, we're excited. 
Thanks, Claire. And Claire Chaikin and Brian, have you? Yeah, the, the, yeah well, that's how I exactly felt uh, leading up to our protothon. No idea what they were going to create. Would they, you know, uh, getting a bunch of 17 uh, year olds in a room and going, right, we're going to do parts art, part arts and crafts and part tech? <laughs> Let's see. And the, a lot of them going, I haven't done this in years. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, they came up with a couple of really great ideas. One uh, was a sign uh, in a park um, that had a number of sensors. So, so we'd given them some sensors they could use. Um, they had a sensor that detected light, a sensor that was for um, uh, temperature. And I'm trying to think what was the other sensor? There was a third sensor in there, but they basically connected the sensors up and you had the sign. Um, and for example, uh, the sign would light up different things depending on what it was. So one was, uh, you know, if it was hot, it, uh, it would tell you it was, you know, it's, it's hot right now. Uh, don't leave your kid in the car. Um, <laughs> Uh, another one was, uh, you know, it's dark, be careful, uh, you know, it's light, put some sunglasses on, um, you know, it's cold, get a jumper. Some, some nice little anecdotes they had on their little uh, prototyped uh, sign, um, but uh, some really interesting ideas about trying to interact with how does a sensor interact with the environment and, and how do we then communicate uh, in that environment what's happened uh, to the people who were in that park. Um, Another one uh, looked at uh, disability, uh, access to transport for people with disabilities um, and having a um, screen that um, they didn't get to build this part because it was too complicated uh, to build out of cardboard, but uh, their idea was a screen that would adjust its height based on the person that walked up to it um, automatically. Uh, and then you could order yourself uh, the particular piece of transport. You could also speak to it if you couldn't uh, see. Um, and also, uh, and they, you know, had a few components with some buttons and lights and the idea would be, you know, in, in reality, it'd be some sort of touch screen thing that you could use and they have a little camera on top that would watch and know how, high, how tall you were. Um, and that was actually in a team of, uh, it was really great, that was in a team where there was a guy uh, who was disabled um, and he was in a team with two other boys who he didn't know, had never met them before and it was great to watch them all come together. He was a, the, the tech head of the team. Uh, we unfortunately, he and another guy uh, from his school were both really good uh, computer coders so we had to split them up and it was great to see the, um, you know, those teenagers come together and that camaraderie and welcoming, uh, well, uh, you know, inclusive, inclusivity that they displayed. Um, and, yeah, obviously he influenced the idea because I think they asked him, so, you know, what would you want? You're the good, you're the good, you're the user. So, um, you know, having the user there and be part of it and design something for not only himself um, was, was really great. Um, we also had an had a idea around um, how can we separate uh, traffic on a road uh, to traffic on footpaths or uh, cycleways um, and the idea was to have these gates that would flick uh, depending on <laughs> who had the right of way of traffic so there was no children running across roads because you could only <laughs> go when the barrier was down. Um, they had some little actuators so they could actually build it out of cardboard where it had the swinging gates and everything um, but yeah they were sort of going you know how do we how do we make it uh, the road um, a safer place uh, for uh, children uh, to be. Um, and they also talked about the fact that, you know, uh, the future with autonomous vehicles and that separating different types of traffic, not just digitally, but physically uh, having physical separation. So, yeah, some really uh, creative ideas there. And, um, yeah, I'm excited for the next time we run one to see uh, what a new group of students come up with. Thank you. So um, I'm going to um, draw this recording part, the recorded part of this meeting to a close now. Um, I know we've run over a little bit, but I just wanted to capture those questions that folks had asked. Um, please do join me in thanking um, both uh, Claire Chaik and Brian and Dr. Claire Murray for their time this evening. Thank you all for your questions. 
and I hope to see you all for our final event um, next week. Uh, we're going to stop the recording now. And uh, on behalf of the Australian Citizen Science Association, we'd really like to thank the Office of the Chief Scientist for supporting this series of talks. So thank you.